we are really happy to have Mindad here. He is so gracious that he even allowed, he, I ran my news article by him where I have those blankety blank uh, roundabouts and Rosie's attitude. So that's his assignment today is to deal with Rosie's attitude. Um, don't tell me that Europe has had roundabouts for years and therefore that's good because Europe gave us two world wars. I don't need this. <laughs> also, from my farm to Cannon Falls is only about two miles and I'm going to have to go through four roundabouts it looks like to get here. Mm -hmm. So I better take Dramamine before I start out, right? Mm -hmm. And I'm sure he can convince me. Then when you want to ask questions, he's graciously said ask questions you can. Go ahead, Ken. Absolutely. Well, thanks, Rosie. Um, my name is Ken Johnson. I'm the state work zone pavement marking and traffic devices engineer. And as you can see, I wore my orange vest because I want to make sure because work zones. <laughs> and I do have orange socks, yes. My wife bought those for me. Um, and I'm very pleased to be speaking to you. Um, does anyone recognize what that symbol is offhand? In fact, it is indeed octopi. See, engineers have a sense of humor too. <laughs> or at least we try. <laughs> um, in addition to talking about roundabouts, there are traffic impacts everybody, and everyone has a, an opinion about traffic. We have a monthly webinar. OTSD is our office, the Office of Traffic Safety and Technology out of MnDOT. We host a monthly webinar called Traffic Topics. And um, to get information on it, all you really need to do is do a web search on MnDOT Traffic Topics and then you'll be able to see our web page, which will talk about the things that we're going to be talking about in the near future. So if you're interested, I do have some cards up here. You can grab that and email me, um, and I'll get you on the distribution for list. But we talk about a whole slew of things. This upcoming one is going to talk about the road system, functional classifications, why are some roads arterials, or why are some roads collectors, and things like that. We're going to do that. We, in the past, we've talked about living snow fences. In the past, we've talked about uh, rumble strips. We've talked about roundabouts. We've talked about pavement markings. We've talked about signing. We've talked about different intersection types. Um, J-turns, you may have heard J-turns being used in some parts of the, uh, off of Highway 52. So there are a whole slew of things that we cover in that. Um, so it'll be a monthly webinar, and I'll be hosting it. So you'll have to get used to seeing me. But aside from that, I think if you're interested, it's got some really good information. So in this roundabout presentation, I'm going to talk about a few things. Why is MnDOT now using roundabouts? Why have we been using roundabouts over the past few years? I'll talk about what a roundabout is. It's not what people think it is necessarily, so I'll talk a little bit about that. I'll talk about the advantages and the goals. I'll talk about where we like to place them. They don't go all over the place. We carefully consider the appropriate location for roundabouts, as we do with other intersection types. And I'll talk about how we decide about roundabouts and um, what we're doing in that area. So there are myths about roundabouts, both on the positive and negative side. Um, they are not social engineering. As Rosie alluded to, it is not the Europeanization of America. On the other side, they're not the solution of world peace either. So everyone's, the only thing they have in common with that is both circular, but that's about the only thing they have in common with world peace. All they are is an intersection control made of concrete, asphalt, gravel, dirt. It's a tool that traffic engineers use to control crossing traffic. And I, I like putting this up because Amish have driven some of the roundabouts around the country and I, they must be thinking those crazy English. So. So intersection controls. Why do we do intersection controls? That's where vehicles cross paths, which leads to delay and the possibility of crashes. So when you come up to an intersection, someone's going to have to wait for someone else to go, and we control that in a variety of different ways. We've got yield-controlled intersections. We've got two-way stop-controlled intersections. And I've got that underlined and bold, and I'll explain why in a second. We've got all-way stop-controlled intersections, where all approaches have to stop. We've got signals, we've got roundabouts, that's a new tool. We've got um, reduced conflict intersections, those J-turns I was talking a little about earlier, and a variety of other types. We've got interchanges out there, we've got different ways of controlling traffic in there. So we need to do something at intersections to make sure that people are safe. 
Now, two-way stop control intersections, MnDOT's good old default. We generally have the arterial that carries the heavy traffic and other roads coming up to it feed into that network. So since mobility is one of MnDOT's major goals, we want to make sure that the through traffic has the right-of-way at most times. And that's why, in most cases, when an intersection comes in, we make it a stop-controlled intersection to get onto the highway. Usually, the highway doesn't have to stop. However, when you get into situations where there are crashes or the side, seat, side street traffic is so heavy that there's excessive delay that occurs to that mine road traffic, that leads to frustration and people taking chances and trying to get into the system. So we end up doing with the different type of intersection controls. Always stop controlled intersections are usually pretty safe, but they're very bad for delay. Everyone has to stop when you come up to it. Everyone has to stop from every legs. And I'll say that there's a lot of confu confusion at those areas. I'm not positive that everyone knows how to tra travel in an always stop controlled intersection, particularly if it's multi-lane approaches. So you've got a left turn lane, right turn lane, and a through lane, and you've got people coming from different directions. There's a lot of confusion at that, so that adds to a lot of delay. Signals, they help with the delay, but people aren't aware of this. Signals can increase certain types of crashes. They're not necessarily a safety device. They are a mobility, de mobility device. They allow the side street traffic to get on a little bit more controlled, but we do increase rear end crashes with signalization, and there has been evidence on high speed approaches that signals are, uh, do not improve safety. Interchanges cost a lot of money. Um, a signalized intersection or a roundabout where you add turn lanes usually costs somewhere between a million to a million and a half dollars. A interchange, $10 million at least for a basic one. Usually they're going to be a 15 to $20 million for an interchange. In the roundabout, in the appropriate application, they are very safe and have less delay than other intersection types. So, and I'll talk a little bit about this a little bit more fully as we go through, but the safety data is there. Roundabouts are the safest intersection type we have, and that's the reason we generally put them in. What most people will notice is when they use a roundabout, it's going to take them less time to get through that intersection than the other intersection controls. And I'll explain that in just a second. So um, here's a little introduction to roundabouts. And I'll see if I could turn up the volume on this. Uh, there it is. So you can hear it. So this is the image that many Americans have. This is from European Vacation. Hey, look, kids, there's Big Ben, there's Parliament. There it is. I can't seem to get over. Son of a, I'll stop there. I can't get left. Look, kids, Big Ben, there's Parliament. And that's what a lot of people have the impression of roundabouts. And what we're building is not that. What he was driving there is a traffic circle. It's not a roundabout. And I'll explain the differences in just a second. It's an unfortunate misconception that a lot of people have. Um, so modern roundabouts are different than other traffic circles. It's a subset of a circular intersection type. There are a variety of circular intersections that exist out there. There are things called rotaries. There are things that are just standard traffic circles. Um, rotaries are much larger, high-speed traffic go around them. You see a lot of those on the East Coast. Um, yep, and I'll talk a little bit about that in just a second. Um, a lot of traffic circles have different types of controls. What makes a roundabout a roundabout is that it's a yield on entry. So as you enter into the roundabout, the circulatory roadway has the right-of-way. Everyone entering has to yield. There are some traffic circles out there where the circulatory traffic has to stop for the entering traffic. And that doesn't work. Um, you can imagine getting into an elevator or elevator into a big building. Um, when that elevator door opens, you have to let the people get out before you get into it. That's the same concept. Or a revolving door. As a revolving door goes around, if that stops, no one can get through. So the yield on entry is the major rule, and that's what the United Kingdom discovered in 1966 that made circular intersections work into these roundabouts. Um, I can mention this. The first, 
a circular intersection built in the United States was in 1905, Columbus Circle in New York. So we've had circular intersections for a long time. A lot of the things you've seen built on the East Coast are those circular intersection types, but they had different rules about them. Um, we kind of gave up, the United States kind of gave up in the 40s and 50s when we started falling in love with the traffic circle. Oh, that seems to work great. It allowed people to get through. Wasn't exactly safe, but it still allowed people to get through it. Um, the Britain, Britain kept with roundabouts and they ended up discovering with that yield on entry, that was the first rule that really made roundabouts work. Um, the other thing that makes a roundabout a roundabout is the counterclockwise circulation. Every vehicle has to go the same way around that roundabout. I've seen traffic circles in St. Paul where it's not defined which way you're supposed to go. In fact, there's a little park in the one I'm thinking about in particular, there's a little park in the middle of it that pedestrians are encouraged to go to. You get up to it and you just don't know how to get around that traffic circle. It doesn't tell you where to go. Um, the geometry of the splitter islands and that central island and things like that force you to go a specific direction. Roundabouts also require a lower speed in order to navigate it. We design them so that you have to drive 20 to 25 miles per hour in order to navigate the roundabout. You have to slow down to be able to drive through that. Um, the speed limit sign does not control your speed going into it. What controls your speed is just the geometry of the road. You have to slow down in order to make those curves. And that's accomplished by those median islands, we call them splitter islands on the approach, and that central island. Pedestrian movements are restricted to the crossing legs. There are a lot of traffic circles out there, Columbus Circle, for example, I brought up that earlier, where the central area, pedestrians are encouraged to go to. So they actually cross that circulatory roadway. Whenever you have pedestrians crossing that circulatory roadway, that's, that impedes the, the circulatory traffic going around it. And the goal of a roundabout is to make sure that that traffic is not impeded so that they can get out so other people can get, can get in. There's also no parking allowed in a roundabout. Traffic circles often allow parking to be within that circulatory roadway, and you can see how that could be a problem. So that's what makes a roundabout a roundabout. Those five things that I just mentioned make it a roundabout as opposed to traffic circles. Most of the traffic circles people have driven on the East Coast and other areas um, didn't follow these rules necessarily. In fact, the first roundabout in the United States was not built until the early 1990s that followed these rules, this was the first time it was built. It was in a, a suburb of Las Vegas, Summerlin, Nevada. That's where they first built the first roundabout in the United States in the early 90s. <clears throat> so here are some of the features I was kind of pointing out. There's the counterclockwise circulation. You have to go around this way. This splitter island here is curved, so it really gives a strong indication of which way you're supposed to go. This truck, ape, excuse me, this central island here is right in the smack dab in the middle of the roadway, so you have to slow down in order to navigate to go around it. There's a truck apron on the outside of these, and that's kind of a raised pavement area. Some people think it looks like a sidewalk, but it's actually meant for the off-tracking of semis as they go around the roundabout. So the semi follows, the, 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 the cab part follows this area, and the wheels off-track on the trailer onto that truck apron. Pedestrians have to cross here. They're not allowed to the central area. And you add bicycle treatments, and this is what a roundabout is. And it's designed so people have to slow down in order to navigate it. 20 to 25 miles per hour is a speed that we design these for. But in England, uh, they travel on this side of the road. Uh, Correct. Do they still go counterclockwise? They go clockwise. They go clockwise. And in fact, I'll, I'll mention that. The, my first experience was a roundup, with a roundabout was in 1999. My wife and I decided to go to Ireland. And um, oh, that was it. And I ended up getting a stick shift. So I'm on the wrong side of the car, driving with a stick shift. Luckily, the clutch was on the right side, so I was able to know where I was supposed to go with that. But I was on the wrong side of the road, wrong side of the car. It was the roundabout that was the intersection I didn't get confused at. Because as you're coming up to it, it was very clear where you're supposed to go. It really told you where to go. Every other intersection type I came up to, because of that left side rule, I had to stop and think, stay on the left, stay on the left. So I, I thought it was kind of weird that um, this is the intersection that made sense because of that issue. So for me, it was like, that's when I really had a realization that roundabouts can work. And then we started investigating it here, and, and I wasn't the only person, but there were a lot of people at MnDOT who were looking into it, and we came up with kind of the way we're going right now. So the types of roundabouts that exist and the volumes that they can handle, um, there are many roundabouts which are really, really small and that central island you can completely go over. We don't have any of those in the state right now. But we've got single lane roundabouts which are what are going to be built at 
uh, off of 52 there at the interchange. And we've got multi-lane roundabouts which have two, three, two or three lanes. That previous slide I showed had two and I got a picture later of a multi-lane roundabout. And these are the ADTs that they can handle, how much entering traffic they can handle. And um, those numbers may not necessarily make sense, but if you put it to other intersection types, so if anyone's been to the State Fair where there's Snelling Avenue and Larpenter right at that north corner, that is handling 53,000 entering vehicles a day. That intersection could, uh, a, a roundabout could handle that traffic, a multi-lane roundabout. Um, let's see if I can get this video to start too. But people are often surprised. You can actually carry that much traffic. This is a roundabout in Avon, Colorado that's handling 4,000 vehicles per hour. And this is a signal that's handling 4,400 vehicles per hour. So pretty equivalent traffic. And it, there's so much going on here where it doesn't seem like it's handling that much traffic there. So because traffic is able to continue going when they have their gap, um, it seems like it's less busy but it's actually pretty equivalent traffic. They can handle a lot of traffic. Uh, here, you don't have, kind of, can of falls, you don't have to worry about that much traffic. You don't have that much. So another, one of the major advantages is reduced delay. So delay is a difference between the travel time through the intersection with no intersection control and the travel time with the intersection control. And that includes a slow down, stop, and speed up time. So delay is defined as that. How much time does it take me to get through without an intersection control, and how much time does it take me to get through with intersection control? A roundabout is always better than an always stop controlled intersection, which just makes sense. At a roundabout, it's a yield entry, so if there's no one coming, you just get to go. At a stop controlled intersection, you have to stop. Whether people actually do that, that's another question, but um, they're supposed to. And if you've got multiple vehicles, they, you do have to stop. A roundabout usually has less delay than a two-way stop controlled intersection if the minor road volumes, the intersecting volumes, are close to the major road volumes. So if you're 70-30 or down to 50-50, the roundabout is going to have less delay to get through it than a two-way stop controlled intersection because the side traffic has to stop in order to get into the system. And it's usually better than a signal. And people are often surprised by that because, well, if it's green, I don't have to stop at all. That's true, but the the side traffic does have to stop. And signals are set up so that they're set up on a time and they are actuated, but they're set up so that someone has to stop at some point. And we found that in the peak hour when the most traffic is going through there, a roundabout will generally have 10 seconds less delay per vehicle going through it than the signal does. And that doesn't sound like much, but if you talk 50,000 vehicles, that's per 50,000 vehicles per day, that time actually adds up. So people go through that in the peak hour, it's a lot less delay for the roundabouts. And that's talking during the peak hour. If you get there at 11 p.m. at night, how often do you have to stop at a stoplight at 11 p.m. at night? Pretty often. At a roundabout, usually no one else is around there, so you're able to just get into there and go. Now the other advantage is increased safety. At a standard intersection like that, you've got 32 conflict points. And this is where traffic either crosses, merges, or diverges from each other. And 16 of those are crossing conflicts. So a car is going this way, another car is going this way. You've got 16 of those at a standard intersection. At a roundabout, you've got four merging conflicts, four diverging conflict conflicts, and no crossing conflicts. So when you take away that crossing conflict, you're really reducing your risk of crashes and you're, you're able to reduce um, the severity of the crash too, and I'll explain that right now. Another reason why I've got increased safety is that you've got a shallow angle of conflict. So the vehicle coming in like this and another vehicle coming in like this, if they hit, it's going to be a fender bender. At a standard intersection, you've got a, a T-bone crash that can happen, which is very, very severe. You've got slower speeds. At st typical intersections, people can be going 40, 50, 60 miles an hour, whatever the speed of that roadway is, you can do that. At a roundabout, again, the geometry forces people to slow down to 20 to 25 miles per hour. So you have a lot less speed in there, which gives you more reaction time to react. Um, you also have a reduced severity of crashes, and I'm an engineer, so I had to put an equation in here. Um, the energy, kinetic energy, is half the mass times speed times speed. So that speed is a huge factor. You multiply that by itself, 
and that really adds to the energy. So a 60 mile an hour crash is going to have far more kinetic energy going into it than a 20 or 25 mile an hour crash. And you also have simplified decision making. At a standard intersection, you come up to it. If it's, a, if it's an always stop control intersection, you have to look that way, that way, that way, and judge when you're supposed to go. And if you've got multiple vehicles, then you really have to look in different directions. At a roundabout, it really is you come up to the yield sign, you look that way, and if there's a gap, go. If not, wait. So you only need to look one direction. A lot of people try to make roundabouts a little bit more complicated than they need to. I've talked with people that when they come up to this yield line, they're looking at all the approaches, and you don't have to. You only need to look to your left to see if anyone is there. You don't have to look over here, over here, because for people to get around that, it takes them a bit of time to get there. So I kind of think about it as if you're in a residential, inter residential neighborhood, you've got your road coming up to a T intersection, that's the type of decision making that you're making when you get to it. You, it's a slow speed because everyone's slow in the neighborhood. They only have to look one direction before they make the right turn. So roundabouts really make the decision making a lot more simple than a standard intersection types. And this is reflected in all the studies that we've looked at related to roundabouts. Um, in 2007, there was a major study done looking at all the roundabouts, that, many of the roundabouts that were in the United States at the time. And what they found is that at with all four-way intersections, you had a 35% reduction in total crashes after the conversion, and this is the important part. 76% change in severe injury, so these are the life-changing crashes. Page up. So severe injury are the life-changing crashes or fatals. So because of that shallow angle of conflict, you don't have the crossing conflicts and other elements, it's Roundabouts virtually eliminate fatal accidents. I won't say get rid of them because it, it can happen anywhere, but they really, really reduce them. We've been finding like a 90 to 95% reduction in fatals when roundabouts are installed. And that, the numbers are similar for all the different types of intersections. If you've got a two-way stop controlled or if you've got signalized or whatever, we're finding a major reduction both in regular crashes and in severe crashes. Now with multi-lane roundabouts, it's a little bit different. Multi-lane roundabouts, because of the fact you've got a couple of lanes entering and a couple of lanes going through there, we have been finding that the overall crash rate at multi-lane roundabouts is about similar to what we get at signals. But we're still getting a 75% reduction in severe injury and fatal crashes. So multi-lane roundabouts, even though they're confusing and they still have the same amount of crashes as signals, we've really reduced injuries and fatals at those locations. They're also safer for pedestrians. If you're a pedestrian crossing at a typical intersection, um, you're crossing, you're looking every direction. You're looking for the traffic coming this way, you're looking for the, so if I'm crossing this, I'm looking this way first, and then I gotta look for the people that are turning back here, or through here, or through here, even at a signalized intersection. I, I don't trust people stopping for red lights, um, because there have been too many cases where people just run through red lights. So there's a lot of exposure at this type of intersection. Plus, if it's a multi-lane approach, so say this as a single lane with a right turn lane and a left turn lane, you have to cross 12, 12, 12, 36, 40 feet before you get to the median. At a standard roundabout with a, um, a single lane roundabout, the distance that you cross in this area is about 20 feet. So less than half is the distance that you have to cross. Plus, you only need to look one direction as you're crossing. In addition, we specifically put the pedestrian crossing at least one car length back from where vehicles are supposed to stop as they enter into the roundabout. So that does a couple of things. A, the driver sees a pedestrian as a separate decision point than entering into the roundabout. They see a pedestrian and it's a, it's a car length away, so that's a decision point. Plus, if the roundabout is congested for whatever reason, or this car is waiting to go around here, that is one car length. So a pedestrian would have a free pass behind that car because that car is stopping people from entering into that intersection. So um, you've got reduced exposure and you've got less, because of less distance to travel and you only have one direction to look. And um, so you have a shorter crossing distance, the pedestrian looks one direction. Drivers at signals, I've seen this many times, that if you watch drivers at signals, they'll stop and watch the light or work on their phone, one of the two, but they should be watching the light. They're not looking at the pedestrians. Um, 
I was at a particular location where there was a signal next to a roundabout, and I, I was watching the, the, the drivers. They were looking at that, that light. They weren't looking at anything else. When I went over to the roundabout, because the drivers had to go around it and their eye path went around like this, they saw the pedestrians all the way around. So that was very helpful for them to pay more attention to the, to the roundabout. So my experience is that people at, drivers at roundabouts pay more attention to pedestrians than they do at standard intersections. Plus, drivers at typical intersections, I know you've experienced this, they drive up to the stop bar, they might glance that way, then they're going over this way, waiting for their chance to turn, and then they go, they don't look again. So um, at a roundabout, because we've separated that decision point, you're not gonna have them run into the, to the pedestrian at that point. Um, the disadvantage, and there are disadvantages, nothing is perfect. Vehicles aren't necessarily stopping, but the reduced speeds do help, and there are some possible issues with visually impaired pedestrians. Now, the speed issue. Um, this is kind of a morbid slide. It tells you what your chance as a pedestrian of getting killed if a car hits you depending upon the speed. And what they found is that if a vehicle hits you at 20 miles per hour, you've got a 5% chance of dying. If a vehicle hits you at 30 miles per hour, it's, not, it's a 40% chance of dying. And then you get up to 40 miles per hour, it's an 80% chance of dying. And if they're going 50, really, you don't have a chance. So this is indicative, you know, we design our roundabouts to be in this range right here, so we really try to reduce the risk to pedestrians in, in that area. And this is evidenced by other countries. Realistically, in the United States, we don't have that many pedestrians. We're a car-driven culture. The UK, because of how condensed they are, they do have a lot of pedestrians going around at the same time as, the, as, as vehicles. What they found is that the injury rate per million peds at small roundabouts, so I'll say a single lane roundabout is uh, 0.33. Their experience at traffic signals is 0.67. So at traffic signals, they have a twice likely chance of getting injured than they would at a roundabout. It's only when you get to a three lane entry that a roundabout has an equivalent injury rate for pedestrians as signals do. Another study was done in Melbourne, Victoria that looked at this. And Melbourne is kind of interesting. I, there are a lot of parallels between Melbourne and the Twin Cities. Um, Melbourne, their metropolitan area is about the same size and population as the seven county metro area up here. Um, the state of Victoria, which Melbourne is in, is about the same size and population as Minnesota. They've got about 4,000 roundabouts in, their, in Melbourne alone, so 4,000. I'm wondering if the roundabouts planned here are single lane. They are single lane. So they've got 4,000 in, in, in Melbourne. What they found in a four-year time frame when they did a study on this, there were 57 total pedestrian crashes from 1371, which sounds like a lot, but it's really not. Out of those 57 pedestrian crashes, four years, 4,000 roundabouts, they had 57 pedestrian crashes. Zero fatalities, and only 32% of those crashes required people to go to the hospital. Um, anecdotal evidence is within that state of Victoria, which is again is the same size and population as Minnesota, they've got 5,000 roundabouts in that state. Um, all of their pedestrian black spot intersections where they're going to spend money to fix it are signals. None of them are roundabouts. They are not having pedestrian problems at roundabouts. So some additional advantages, you've got reduced environmental impacts. Because you've got less delay going through it, you're using less gas to go through there. And the studies have indicated that your emissions are reduced. There's kind of a magic number. Once you get below two to three miles per hour, your car kicks out a lot more bad stuff. But if you're able to just kind of glide into the roundabout and not have to fully stop, you really reduce the noxious, noxious emissions that come out of your vehicle. And many would argue that the more pleasant to live next to because it's a constant flow of traffic as opposed to hard braking and hard acceleration. So here's a case study. This is the first rural roundabout that we built in the Metro District. It was at Trunk Highway State Highway 13 and Scott County Road 2. This is what it ended up looking like after it was built. Prior to putting the roundabout in, it was a rural two-way stop-controlled intersection, so high-speed approaches. It was 55 miles per hour on all approaches. You know people were going faster. In that five-year period, there were 26 injury crashes, nine property damage, and two fatal crashes, which resulted in 50 injuries and two fatalities. 
in the five years after that it was opened, that dropped down to five reported crashes, down to three injuries and no fatalities. Huge, huge reduction in, in, in crashes and huge improvement in safety at that location. Um, since then, I've only heard of maybe two more crashes occurring that, so up to 2014, so if we go for a nine year time frame, we're up to seven crashes. As opposed to 50 injuries and two fatalities happening in five years prior. There's another case study that I can talk about in Golden, Colorado. South Golden, Golden, Ro Golden Road in Golden, Colorado, before they built roundabouts, it was a three quarter mile long segment of a four lane expressway with a two way left turn lane. That's that suicide lane people call it sometimes, that, that two way left turn lane in the middle. All the businesses had driveway accesses just off the road. There were only two signals there. They were gonna add a signal but because of adding a signal, they ended up investigating that entire corridor to see what ought to be done. There were residential neighborhoods off of it, businesses, there's a high school nearby, so there's a lot going on at that intersection. So that's what it looked like before. And I'm sure you've seen roads like this. I think Robert would be fair, similar like this if you think of the C Twin Cities. This is what it looks like after. So they took the two signalized intersections converted that to four roundabouts that they built in the late 90s. That's an over high view. So what they found is that the travel time through the corridor reduced. So with the two signals, it was taking 78 seconds to go through there. Adding the third signal would have brought it up to 103 seconds to get through that intersection. With four roundabouts, that reduced to 68 seconds. So it took you less time to get through there. And what's and the intersection delay was reduced. Um, this really surprised a lot of people. To get into the businesses, that delay was reduced too. So you, we turn, they, they turned the left turns out into you would have to do a U-turn and then a right turn in. So you end up having to do an indirect route to get into it. Um, prior, it took 28 seconds on average to get into the businesses, up to two minutes to get into it. After, it was reduced by half. The, they found that the right turn U-turn is safer and quicker than the left turn in. A lot of times you're waiting in that left turn lane, waiting for your gap, waiting for your gap, and it takes a long time, where you could just go up the intersection, do a U-turn, and do a right in. What was really surprising, now keep in mind that it now takes less time to get through that, that, that corridor. The speed reduced. So to get through that corridor, prior to that, the 85th percentile speed, that means the speed at which or under 85% of the people were driving, it took, it, they were going 47 miles per hour. But because the geometry of those roundabouts forced people to slow down, they didn't see a need to speed up in between intersections. When they're at a stop sign, they feel like they're losing a lot of time, and so they try to go faster after that. So stop signs can actually increase speeds. Um, so it takes less time to get through that corridor, but it's, people are going slower. It seems counterintuitive, but that's what they found. And the crash rates were just incredible. They reduced overall crashes 85%. Injury crashes were reduced 96%. And that's the same time that the daily traffic increased. So it was just a really good example of how roundabouts and the right application can work. So where should we put roundabouts? Essentially, where we can put signals, we can put roundabouts. So they're equivalent to each other. But it's best if it's a roughly the same functional classific classification. So an arterial versus an arterial, so highway to highway, residential road to residential road. Generally, that's the best place to put it. You can maybe do one step separation, but you want to generally have balanced flows because you can get a higher capacity out of it. So if your one road has equivalent, relatively equivalent traffic to the other road, you can get more capacity out of that roundabout. More traffic can get through it. Um, they can handle all levels of pedestrian volumes. Where shouldn't you put roundabouts? And we absolutely think about this. You should not put them in a corridor where you've got a well-operating coordinated signal system. So if you've got a corridor like Cedar, as you head northbound up into the Twin Cities, um, Dakota County has specially set up those signals to handle platoons going up so you don't have to stop very often. If you've got a corridor like that, that's gonna work well with signals. Or if you can't get the roundabout to fit, Roundabout is bigger at the intersection. You, have, you need less lanes to come up to it, but it's bigger at the intersection. If you can't get the roundabout to fit, that's, you shouldn't put it in. So there are locations where roundabouts actually shine. So if you've got a weird number of legs, like five legs coming into it, 
that might be a good place for a roundabout because they can handle that traffic a little bit better. If you've got rural intersections with high crashes or high delay, that's a good location for them. If you've got high left turns on one or more legs, again, that left turn is one of those dangerous moves because that's going to be a crossing conflict. At a roundabout, you turn that crossing conflict into a merging and you just go around. And so you've turned that into a, um, that type of crash with that and roundabouts are set up well to handle that. So interchange locations such as 52 is a fantastic location for roundabouts. The other advantage is that the bridge width can be less with this. Um, with a standard intersection, you normally have to put in a right turn lane and a left turn lane on the approach. So your cross section of your bridge has to be extremely wide because you need to have that right turn lane, through lane, left turn lane, another through lane. So you have a large area there. A single lane roundabout only needs about 20 feet of width as opposed to that 40 feet I was talking about earlier. So your width of the bridge is less, so it's much less expensive bridge. In Medford, when they built the Medford roundabouts as going to the Medford Outlet Mall, they saved $2 million on that bridge alone. Not anything else related, but just on the bridge alone, they saved $2 million by putting in roundabouts at those intersections as opposed to their typical intersections. They're great near schools or playgrounds because drivers can see the pedestrians a lot better. Through small towns or commercial corridors, that uh, Golden, Colorado is a perfect example for this. And I would advocate that if a, you know, if you've got a, a rural town where you've got a trunk highway, a state highway going through it, and the residents are always saying, slow the traffic down, you gotta slow the traffic down going through town. MnDOT, if we do put up a speed limit, if the rest of the environment does not say, slow down, people aren't gonna ignore that speed limit. It's just known. We, we've, we've done study after study after study. People follow the road environment more than they do that speed limit sign. With a, but if you put a roundabout on either side of that town, people have to slow down in order to get into town. So what about multi-lane roundabouts? There is a concern, and it's a valid concern, that some Minnesota drivers find them confusing. Um, and we do have similar crash rates as we do at signals because um, people aren't necessarily, so not necessarily yielding. I'll show a picture about where the main crashes that we're discovering are occurring. However, we're still getting that 75% reduction in injury crashes. So we're nervous about putting multi-lane roundabouts in a little bit, but sometimes we end up putting it in anyway because we expect that 75% injury reduction. So if we've got injury crashes, it's still something that we're strongly considering. Um, and most typical crashes are caused by not following the signs. So this, that failure to yield at both lanes at entry, and I'll show that in a second. We are working on education for that. Best advice, if you come to a multi-lane roundabout, is to follow the signs and the pavement markings. One of the issues is that people who want to turn right, they don't get into that right lane, they stay in that left lane because they think they can get into the roundabout and leave any lane that they want. Um, realistic, and I'll show you that in just a second. So, this is an example I'll show right here. So we put pavement markings in there, so you can either go through or you can go left, which means go up around here and then go left that way. Where we're still seeing crashes is where this lane can go straight through, this lane can go straight through, this lane stops, this car stops and yields for both lanes because they have to, but this car coming in here thinks that they're continuing and going that way and they're going on through here and that's the type of crash we're still experiencing. That right lane is not necessarily yielding to the traffic within the roundabout. It's still a fender bender. It's not an injury crash, but that's the typical crash that we're seeing. And so we're really trying to educate. You might see out under the yield sign, yield to both lanes or other things. We're, we're, we're working on that. But, um, and here is a YouTube video that unfortunately you won't be able to hear. Um, so I want to, well, the visuals, I'll try to explain what's happening. And you could just go to YouTube and look for, um, similar videos on how to drive multi-lane roundabouts. But what they're essentially telling you right here is pay attention to which way you want to go, look at the signs. So if you want to turn right, you're going to want to stay on the right-hand side. If you want to go left, there are signs maybe above you that tell you what lane you ought to be in as you approach the roundabout. We haven't gone to this yet. We are building these in um, Mankato at a multi-lane roundabout down there. But we've typically been putting the signs on the side of the road. So the main thing is to slow down, yield to bicycles and pedestrians. 
be in the correct lane, stop, look, and if there's a gap, here's where the yield line is. You have to wait for that person, effort, just go. So you don't have to look all the way around, you only really have to look one direction, even at a multi-lane roundabout, as long as you're in the right lane ahead of time. Single lane roundabouts people get relatively quickly. Um, what they have found with single lane and multi lane roundabouts that when they're before they're put in, and this has been looked at across nationwide, and so it's pretty consistent all across the country. Before they're put in, about two thirds of the people who live there are against roundabouts, and one third are in favor. After it's been in for two months, it flip flops. Two-thirds of the people are strongly in favor of the roundabouts or in favor of the roundabouts, and there's still some people who don't like it. But it really flip-flops. Public opinion switches quickly when they discover the advantages of these roundabouts. Okay, but how about learning? Right. The, the learning curve? Um, we're still going through that. On some of our multi-lane roundabouts, we're still having crashes that we don't like to see. Again, we're not having injury crashes, but and they're equivalent to putting a signal in there, so we're less worried about it, but we do want to reduce those, those types of crashes too. So again, we're trying to do, we, we, we've got the state map, and on the back of the state map is how to drive a roundabout. If you Google, in fact, I've got some education, education efforts, great segue. Um, we've got the roundabout webpage, so just to do a web search on MnDOT roundabouts. At the state fair a couple of years ago, we handed out a roundabout on a stick. It was just a little thing that showed what to do. Uh, the, on the back of the Minnesota state map, there's information about that. When a project is going in, we're trying to do education efforts, so trying to get information in the newspapers and trying to get out there and talk to people about roundabouts. And Washington County, they are building a lot of roundabouts as well, so they've developed a roundabout U, and you can get to that by just Googling roundabout U. So their education efforts, it's really difficult to get to everyone's homes, though, um, to really do the education. So. I'm hoping this goes out, and I'm hoping that you're able to talk to some of your friends about some of the things that we've talked about today. And here's a picture of State Highway 52 in Cannon Falls, and the project website, you could just Google Highway 52 Cannon Falls uh, MnDOT, and you'll be able to get to that website. But here's essentially what it's going to look like, and all of these are single lane roundabouts. So prior to this, and here's the other thing too. Um, another advantage of this type of system where you have the closely spaced intersections is if these were signals, there is a strong chance that the signal here could impact traffic and it would go into that intersection and block it. But because we've reduced delay by 10 seconds per vehicle, even in the peak hour, these tend to fl flow more smoothly. At this location, you probably wouldn't have had that type of traffic that would have caused those backups, but Jamaica in Cottage Grove absolutely did. Prior to putting in those roundabouts, we had severe crashes left and right for people exiting that ramp because everyone is stuck at that ramp interchange. Um, and we couldn't, there was a railroad bridge in this area, so we could not, and with the frontage road, so the railroad bridge, frontage road, intersection, was just way too tight. And so that's why they put in a roundabout there. A vehicle coming this way, if there's a vehicle right here, th they have to wait for this vehicle right there. So the vehicle in the circulatory roadway has a priority in all cases. Um, and in the peak hour, that's where you're gonna see people stopping and waiting for their chance to get in. During non-peak hours, with the volumes that I would see here, it's not gonna be that many. You're gonna have plenty of chances to get into this roundabout without even, um, you're gonna have to slow down. Again, yield, and that's the other education, I'd love to get out there. Yield means slow down and be prepared to stop. I would love to see some of our stop signs converted to yield signs because no one's following it, the stop sign anyway. We've done studies and found that 12% of drivers do what they're supposed to at a stop sign. Only 12%. And when, with that realization, we really ought to maybe think of doing something else, but no one's ready to go to the yield. Say this was a regular stoplight, you would have had to stop here, wait for your chance to go, and you'd start from zero. So really it's no different than if it was a standard intersection. The roundabout really doesn't make a difference as far as getting up to speed. Some truck drivers have indicated, but others do like them. When they put them in Medford, that one location that I talked about, um, the truck drivers ended up liking them because it gave them more gaps to get in. Because everyone has to slow down, and that's another thing that I discovered, um, that rural Scott County roundabout has a lot of implements of husbandry going through it, so farm vehicles. And what they found 
is because everyone has to slow down to navigate that roundabout, 20 to 25 miles per hour, they have a much greater chance of getting in. And so truck drivers end up liking them because they've got a chance to get into the system as opposed to two-way stop controlled intersections where they have to wait such a long time for a suitable gap for them to get in. So some, but some truck drivers are still learning that, that, what that truck apron is for. So, and that's one of the education. So when you see that, that big honking mound of dirt, on the outside of that is um, a paved area that looks different than the road surface. Um, it is at a different angle and it's made to look different than the road surface because we don't want passenger vehicles to cut through the roundabout quickly. So it, it would be uncomfortable for a passenger vehicle to drive over that truck apron, but it's designed to take the uh, trailer wheels to hop up on it as they go around the roundabout. The, there was a question about so much traffic being on Highway 52, how are you going to be able to get on at that location? Um, that really isn't a function of the roundabouts. That's a function of the interchange. So whatever interchange would have been put here, wouldn't have mattered what type of intersection control you would have had here, whether it was signals, roundabouts, two-way stop controlled intersection, always stop controlled intersection. Um, it's still going to be the same as you're trying to get onto Highway 52. But the volume of traffic on here is less than what we see in the Twin Cities metro area, and people still have gaps to get into, even in the metro area. Well, if this was a light and there wasn't an interchange, that is a different situation. But an interchange like this handles a lot more traffic. Um, a signalized intersection, um, people crossing it would have to wait for that, that signal, plus a signal on a high-speed expressway like this, we generally would expect to increase crashes. Um, an interchange design like this, regarding, forget about the roundabouts at all, this is a, what we would call a diamond interchange, doesn't matter what these intersection controls are, this is a diamond interchange. We find that interchanges and those accesses onto our highway systems are the safest um, design that we have. Um, interse any intersection has a lot more crashes than interchanges do because you're turning crossing conflicts, like I explained a little bit earlier, into those merging conflicts. So you're looking for your gap to get into traffic in one specific direction as you enter onto the system, or you're crossing over it without any conflict whatsoever because you're crossing over the, over the highway. Um, interchanges are our safest intersection solution. They're just very, very expensive. I don't know how much this, it, this project cost, but I've seen other projects in other parts of the uh, metro area where this would have been easily 25 to $30 million. Again, I don't know how much this one cost, but I've seen similar projects elsewhere that cost quite a bit of money. But it is very, very safe compared to a signalized intersection that would have been with Highway 52. Emergency vehicles have found that they like roundabouts <laughs> um, because people are easily able to get out of it. At a standard intersection, people might block the way at times, whereas at a roundabout, because the, 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 ro the circulatory roadway is a little bit wider than what's necessary because it needs to be handled as circulatory movement, even if vehicles stop in their trafficking um, emergency vehicles and get around them, but even you're supposed to get out of the roundabout if you can and pull off on the side. That's what the driver should do if the emergency vehicle comes up when they're in the roundabout. But there's enough area in there for them to be able to get around relatively easily. Um, in fact, <laughs> patrol, they've indicated that they like roundabouts at times because if people are driving too fast and if they are trying to flee, um, they can't handle the turns and so they end up, um, they end up being traps for people who are trying to get away from, from police. So I'll talk about work zone safety and then I'll answer overall questions. I just wanted to talk about this because I was asked to talk about highway hazards. And I'm the work zone engineer and this is a big, big issue that we're dealing with. Um, first, I'm going to give you a pop quiz. Um, interactive, hopefully that will be entertaining. So how many active work zones do you think there are each day on the state highway system? This is just the state highway system. There are about 12,000 miles of state highway system. So that's <laughs> at, at any time. It depends on the time of year. Very good. And I'll give you 2013 data. It ranges on January 1. We had 36 
work zones out there that were impacting traffic. 36 on New Year's Eve day, up to 191 in 2013, August 24th. And, and I'm not counting like the, uh, 30, like the, the Cannon Falls project right here that might be impacting traffic. I'm counting that as a separate per day type thing. So it's an overall project, but it's impacting traffic each day. So if you count that, we have with over 39,000 issues of work zones that are happening on the state highway system each year. It's, it's a staggering amount. When we came up with that number, I had to look at it again. Really? Um, yeah, it ends up being <laughs> more than that. And that's just on the state highway system. So this is information that we put into 511. Um, if you've heard of 511mn.org, you can go to that site or 511. Um, when we put information in there of an element of work zone that we think is going to impact traffic, that's what this is. 39,000 instances of that in the state highway system. Work zone crashes in Minnesota. In 2013, we had eight fatal crashes, 11 life-changing crashes. These are things where a person's hurt seriously enough that they're going to feel it for the rest of their life or will impact for the rest of their life. Total of 1,748 crashes. Um, over 10 years, we've had 88 fatal crashes with 70 life-changing crashes and 18,000 total crashes. These are just numbers. I just want to give you an idea of the scale. However, Minnesota, we do pretty good. We have the second to third lowest fatality rate in the country. And what that means, when I talk about rate, that's the amount of fatals per million vehicles that are just driving. So we, that's based on the volume of, of traffic out there versus that. Um, the couple of states that beat us are like New Hampshire or Vermont, really, really small states. But um, we, we're doing really good. Minnesota has a towards zero deaths effort. We are specifically trying to implement things that are going to reduce our fatal crashes. That's our main goal. That's MnDOT's overriding safety thing right now is to reduce fatal and life-changing crashes. That's our, our, our number one prime directive. Let's just call it that. Rosie. No. I, weirdly enough, it, people are doing this for workers. We're, we're doing a lot of things for worker safety, and that is laudable. But 90, 90 to 95% of our fatals are drivers. So the things that we're doing benefit both the drivers and the drive, both the workers and the drivers. But um, realistically, it's the drivers that are more risk, more risk out there. And so that's why we're really trying to, what are the causes of work zone crashes? I'll talk about that right now. So what do you think are the causes of work zone crashes? What are causing people to crash, a, crash in work zones? Any thoughts? Excessive speed. Excessive speed, I hear that. So the merging. Any other thoughts? Impatience. Todd, right? Steve. Steve. Oh, sorry. You remind me of someone. <laughs> um, turns out 27% of all crashes, 27% of fatal and injury crashes up there, it's driver inattention or distraction. That's actually, if you think about it, that's not surprising. Um, I was driving into Prescott one day um, on, on the, in the left lane. It was a 45 mile hour zone and a woman was passing me literally and it doesn't matter what sex a person was, because I've seen, ev everyone has issues. The person was playing Sudoku oh while driving. And I, I said, oh, get, my wife is next to me, take a picture of her, take a picture of her, because this would have been great. But I was going 45, this person was going 55, and I didn't want to risk it in this particular area. So <laughs> um, it would have been a great picture. Sudoku, I've never seen that before, but <clears throat> people are looking at their phones, their, their major issues, they're impaired. Um, following too closely is another one. Both driver inattention and following too closely is related to speed, but realistically, the illegal or unsafe speed, it is a contributing factor, but it's not as high as those other things. Um, and failure to yield right away is another contributing factor, but really it's driver inattention that's the big issue for us. So based on that, we are doing a major ad campaign right now, Orange Cones, No Phones, Workers' Lives Are at Stake. We're saying workers' lives are at stake because that's a perception out there and we feel that people will slow down because they see the workers out there. Realistically, it's for their own safety and it's for the safety of the drivers next to them because again, 90 to 95 percent of our fatals are drivers. But we're trying to get that message out there and we have had workers hit. Um, my wife works at MnDOT as well 
She is the traffic services engineer for Metro, so she supervises the, the crews that do work zones, um, signing and striping within the Metro district. And a, um, a week ago Sunday, one of her employees was hit, someone that she knew very well. Um, he just, he was hit by a driver that was, um, we believe was impaired. Um, that information hasn't necessarily gotten out yet. But um, he was setting up cones. He, there, we had a protection vehicle. He was setting up cones ahead of that protection vehicle. A driver swerved around. He didn't get out of the way. He got hit. He flipped, um, landed on his head, and then he's got serious head injuries. And um, didn't pass away. And I've only heard recently that um, he's able to have sensation of one side of his body that we were concerned about. But this is impacting you know, us personally and directly. I mean, workers are, are, are having issues out there. So 95% of the problem is, not problem, the benefit will be to drivers, but we're also going to improve safety for workers for do that. So you may see billboards like that up there. Hang up. <laughs> workers are lives are at stake. Orange cones, no phones. The Association for General Contractors tried to get changes made to statute in order to improve worker safety. A um, couple things did get into that. We're going to reduce speeds in work zones where workers are present. Uh, we're going to be doing that. But we also tried to get in there if workers are present, that uh, AGC, I should say, AGC is a lobbying group. Um, if workers are present, people were supposed to get off their phones. And it was kind of frustrating for me because I had to testify to the legislature a couple of times and a couple of legislators up there saying, now, you, you, now you're telling me that if I'm on the phone with someone and it's very important and I see a worker, I need to hang up. But what if it's an important call or, or what if, wouldn't it be more dangerous for me to hang up and then redial later? Yes, I want you off that phone. I couldn't say that because it was, he didn't say Mr. Johnson answer me. Um, but we really do want people to do that. And so that did not get into law. Um, but it, there was an effort towards it. We might see it on pump toppers as well, and we've got radio bits on it too. Um, and I'll, I'll open it for questions right now, but I do have other things I can answer if you, if you have questions. I know we're to 1110 right now. I don't know how long you guys want to stay here. It's a hot room, but you got me captive for a little bit. So um, the, que the, the concern question was, what about rumble strips? In some areas, they have been taken out due to public pressure. Rumble, rumble strips, okay. Um, they are... I love to use the word, it's a technical term, corrugations <laughs> into the pavement. Um, I don't think I've got a slide immediately able to see, but they're indentations that are put into the pavement that rumble when you drive over them. Um, and we've got shoulder rumble strips, we've got edge line rumble strips, those are on the fog line, and we've got center line rumble strips. Um, a couple of advantages of rumble strips is as you leave the lane, they rumble to tell you when you're coming off of the lane. Um, and if you've got a marking within, if you've got a pavement marking within a rumble strip, in wet night conditions, you can see the markings. If a marking is surface applied and you've got rain, you can't see the marking because it's just the, the water sheets over it and when the um, light from your headlight hits it, it reflects in different directions. So, but when you put a stripe in a rumble, it has all those different directions that the beads are facing so you can actually see pavement markings when it's raining at night if they're in a rumble. So that's the other advantage of it. Did you ever do any studies on how invasive these rumble strips are to individuals that live along them? We have done... Businesses and, and residences? We try to, when we put together the policy for putting rumbles in, the, the goal was to put them only on rural high-speed roads. We don't put them in urban areas, and so if an area is listed as urban or urbanizing, um, we don't put rumbles in those particular areas. We've been putting them in rural high-speed road situations because of this reason. We've been finding that over 52, about 52 percent of the fatals that happen on the state highway system are due to people leaving the lane. So they're either crossing into head-on traffic or they're leaving the lane on the right-hand side of the road. And over the past five years, we've lost close to a thousand people in the state fatal crashes due to lane departure crashes. The studies have been clear that, to indicate that if we put in centerline rumble stripes, we reduce the chance of a, a crossover crash by 40%. And if we put in shoulder rumble strips, we reduce the chance of crashes on that side by 30 to 40% as well. So we expect a reduction, a huge reduction, and that's part of that whole towards zero deaths effort. That's why we're putting them in on rural high-speed roads. 
And the other reason we're putting them on those particular roads is when we look at those crash, when we dig into the data, what we find is that the care, these, these types of lane departure crashes happen all over the place. They're not specifically set in different areas. If I showed you 2009, 2010, 2011, a state map of where these lane departure crashes are happening, they're all over. They're here, 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 here. So what we had to do is actually look at characteristics of the road. And what we found is that that type of crash usually occurs on rural, high-speed roads and impact young drivers the most. Um, and distracted drivers. So there are quite a few things like that. So that's why we came up with that overall policy. So in order to avoid the noise issue, we ended up moving them off of the fog line and trying to do that. So we know that there's an impact to that, but I've got good news coming. <laughs> um, <clears throat> we have just started doing a study because in Northern Europe, they've got another type of rumble out there called the sinusoidal rumble. Um, they've only developed it over the past couple of years. We got some information about that, and California has, has looked at a sinusoidal rumble, and other Pennsylvania contractors installed one. We've installed a couple to test in our area, and we found that the sinusoidal rumble um, doesn't have the same noise impact inside the vehicle, so we're still a little concerned on that, but outside the vehicle, it dramatically reduces noise. And we've only discovered this over the past year, so we're investigating that right now. So we are looking at alternative rumble designs in order to deal with the noise issue, but um, it was a trade-off that MnDOT ended up looking at, uh, saving lives versus um, noise impacts to people who might live nearby them. And it, it was a tough decision, but um, that was one of the things we were looking to is we're trying to reduce. I received two letters specifically saying that my life was saved because of a, rum a centerline rumble strip. I've, I've, ha I've received two letters of people whose lives were saved by having them in there. So why wasn't it for me for Cook and St. Louis County then? Uh, St. Louis County and Cook County, that is a decision that the district engineer ended up making and each district can make decisions on their own and that district engineer chose to remove them in particular areas. Generally our practice has been if there's a farmhouse or a residential access, so if there's residential access, we pull about 200 feet away from that residential access so people can do the country left turn, you know, so that if people are following too closely and they want to turn in the driveway, they can cross over with cross, crossing over those. So that's what our general practice has been. We've, um, we're re-looking at this, we're re-adapting our policy, we're modifying it in order to deal with the public concerns that we've heard about this. My concern is that we've got, if we have so many gaps out there, um, I, one situation that I've found that rumbles are very useful, and I live off the side of a road relatively close to the highway too, so I, I, I know what noise impacts are. Um, I want Wisconsin to put rumbles in front of my property, but that's just my opinion, um, because on those snowy, when, when, when the on those nights when the snow is going back and forth and you can't see anything, I've actually used those rumbles in order to make sure that I've stayed within the travel lane. And if we've got a lot of gaps in other areas, if people are expecting to see rumbles, I'm a little bit concerned about that. Um, so anyway, we are looking at alternatives to make it better um, because we have heard the outcry, but we're also trying to save lives. And so it's a very, it's, it's, it's a, we're, we're weighing the issues and trying to come up with better solutions. Because it is the accepted nationwide color that we have to use. The federal government has come up with the standards for what we have to use. I can go in. Okay. Um, the federal government has come up with standards that have to be used across the country so that a person driving in California, I should point California over here, well, depending on your point of view, California and Vermont, they know what to expect from the traffic control devices. It's called the Manual on Uniform Traffic Control Devices. And if you've got different rules for colors in one part of the country from other or signs that are allowed to be different or things like that, it adds to confusion. So there's a nationwide standard. Now Minnesota, by law, we have to come up with our own manual, manual on uniform traffic control devices. The commissioner is, is charged with that responsibility and I'm actually responsible for a couple of those chapters myself. But the federal law related to this says that any manual that any state has to develop has to be in what's called substantial conformance with the um, federal standards. And so uh, it, it's related to that. Um, the other issue is that other markings in other times of the year are, are more difficult to see. 
So if you tried to, we, we can't use orange because that's defined to be used for work zones. We, um, we don't have a lot of color choices that can be used that are visible in, uh, at other times. So during the summer on, on bituminous road or on a concrete road, it's much easier to see white than you would be able to see other colors. So that whole mix goes together. We're following a federal standard. It's not just in winter that we have to worry about the lane lines, it's other times of the year too, and we have to worry about the visibility, and we need to be able to get more pop back so you can see farther down the road. If it was a, a lavender color, you wouldn't be able to see it as far. So there's a whole slew of things that go into why we ended up having those specific colors for pavement markings. Well, we've, we've had roundabouts for the past five or six years, and maintenance, at least MnDOT maintenance forces have learned how to deal with them. Y yes, they are more challenging during snow plow. But again, it's weighing what works and we're trying to save lives and that kind of thing and, and reduce delay. Here's Medford. I, I could have brought this up to you. This is the Medford roundabouts. This is a six-legged roundabout. It's got a frontage road coming in with the ramps there. That's the bridge that I was talking about that would have cost $2 million more had we put in standard intersections because you would ne have needed to widen it. So this was an application where unusual number of legs and it's worked out very well. This is the location where the truckers love it because now they can get into the system whereas they couldn't before. Um, total cost of the interchange would have been less because standard intersections, if you start from scratch, they'll cost more because you're putting down a lot more pavement. When we retrofit an intersection, if we're putting in a signal, we typically have to put in turn lanes and so forth, or if we retrofit an existing intersection to a roundabout, we're, that's what we're gonna, that's cost about a million to a million and a half, whether you go to a signal or to a roundabout, so that retrofitting. If you're starting from scratch, a um, whole slew of things can fit into it too, how much right away you have and so forth, but generally roundabouts are less expensive. Plus, um, whenever we put down pavement, we have to put in ponding um, because of run stormwater runoff. Because roundabouts have less pavement surface that you put down, we need to acquire less right-of-way for that ponding. So we generally have to acquire less right-of-way for roundabouts than we do for intersections. Um, whenever MnDOT looks at, a, at an intersection for improvement, we do something called an ICE report, intersection control evaluation. And into that decision, we take all those bits of information. How much does it cost here? How many, um, what's the injury rate gonna be and so forth? And there are some instances where a signal, we still put it in because that's the appropriate solution. Other instances we're putting in a roundabout, we are thoughtfully determining what the appropriate fix is for each intersection. And so we actually have a formalized approach in order to make sure that we do what should be the right thing based on our engineering judgment. And public opinion goes into that too. They, we've studied that actually, and we found that it, is, it doesn't have a seriously negative effect on motorcyclists. Uh, according to the study that we did, and I, I, it's on our website, if you Google MnDOT Rumbles, there's a report that looked into it, and I don't know all the details, but um, in the executive summary that I did read, it said that the motorcyclist um, felt that they were uncomfortable to drive, but they didn't think that they were a safety disbenefit to them driving them. Um, my predecessor, one of the things that he said, and I, I don't know how this is going to sound on camera, but um, think of in your high school um, when you're graduating, the stupidest person in the class, the person who was the, the, the um, meanest, or think of the meanest person or, or the stupidest person, did they have a driver's license? More than likely. And so that's, that's one of the issues we're dealing with is we're dealing with people, everyone. Um, so when we design our roads, we try to design to a reasonable level, but we also have to take into consideration that um, there are people who drive unsafe and other things like that. That's why we've got laws. So um, the four E's, the towards zero deaths effort includes a lot of things. The four E's, engineering, that's what I'm involved in. Emergency services, the people who can get out there quick to save people. Um, education, how to learn how to drive, and enforcement. Enforcement is a key part of that. So if you ever hear people talk about the four E's of towards zero deaths and trying to reduce crashes and trying to reduce improve safety, we have to have all those things. And that person, you really hope there would have been enforcement nearby to deal with that issue. Our state, we have a no use of electronic devices. You can call on your phone, but you can't be texting. It's kind of called the no texting law, but it really impacts other things too. So you shouldn't be doing other things on it. Um, 
a lot of people use their phone for navigation, and technically the law says that you shouldn't use it, but I've talked with troopers who said, we let people use it for navigation just because it's such a useful device, and it does actually improve safety because people are told where to go if they're confused. But um, the strict reading of the law <laughs> is um, you shouldn't be using that for any purpose other than making phone calls. And in some states you can't call In some states you can't use it for, um, I, I haven't heard of any state banning it completely. They'll, they'll ban the handheld use of it, so you have to use Bluetooth or a hands-free type system. I mean, that's the other thing too, a little statistic that you can share with your friends at the dinner party. Um, when you're using a cell phone, when you're on a conversation, whether you're talking into the phone or you're just talking to an earpiece that's tied to it, you've increased your chances by four. So you've multiplied your chance of getting into a crash at that particular instance by four. If a person is texting, you've multiplied your chances of incre uh, you've, mul you've increased your chance of having a crash by 32. So texting or that type of use really increases your crash your crash rate. But even talking on the phone, and it's because part of your brain is distracted. You know, you may see everything around you, but there is energy going on in your brain doing something. So if you're talking to having talking with someone outside the vehicle, that is different than talking to someone inside the vehicle because a person inside the vehicle is also relatively aware it's happening and they could stop talking or you could say hold it. Person on the other side of a phone line is not. So if you're having a deep conversation with someone, whether you you're holding onto the phone or just talking on the thing, Study after study have showed that you have a greater chance of being in an accident. So um, the TZD effort is strongly encouraging people to just not be on their phones at all while driving, but there's no law right now about that being on the phone to talk. There's that. It's less electrical savings than you think, though, because we light all of ours. We want people to be able to see the pedestrians, so we specifically put lights where the pedestrian crossings are, so we do have them lit. Plus. That also helps with the rural intersections too. If you're coming up like that Scott County deal, you could see the lit intersection and that helps you see overall. So it's still less electricity and less maintenance than signals are, but um, we, do, we do have electrical costs at them because we want to make sure that they are lit and people can see them. What he brought to my attention was that we're talking about seconds. We're waiting seconds. When I'm waiting at that stoplight on 52, it doesn't seem like seconds. What is our mindset nowadays? So we've got to, we can't wait two minutes. And, I, and I'm one of them, so appreciate that. We'll have more questions if you want to talk to Ken afterwards. Appreciate it very much. Oh, it's a, it's a pleasure. So Why did Jesse James and his gang decide to come to Minnesota? Well, there is a Minnesota connection okay. to the existing building. So we grew to 92,000 uh -huh. square feet. So we're about three times bigger than where we were at the other facility. Uh, 